I seldom do this, but it makes sense. And we'll do it all through the season of Lent. I'm reading one verse. Just one. Jesus is on the cross. And his first words are, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. May God truly bless his written word. In the spring of 1988, I had just been appointed to go to the Central United Methodist Church in Kansas City. And not only was the senior minister there retiring, for me to take his place, but one of the associate ministers had, was retiring as well. So I got in my car and I drove to the seminary that I attended myself at Southern Methodist University Perkins School of Theology. And I was set up to interview oh, about 10 young sprouts coming right out of seminary. My first interview was with a young man named Adam Hamilton. I didn't interview any of the other nine. I didn't need to. I found the right choice. But he said something, even at that time, to me. He said, I'll come, I'll be your associate minister for two years, and then Mary, I want to start a new church. <laughs> I said, I understand that passion. I've started a new church myself over in the St. Charles area, and what a wonderful experience that is. But give me two years of your life. For two years, he challenged me, and I challenged him, and it was Camelot. It really was. And that's Adam Hamilton, who now serves Church of the Resurrection of over 12,000 members in South Kansas City. Love that man. Joseph Heller is perhaps best known as the author of the book Catch-22. But in another novel, one that takes its title from the opening sentence from the second paragraph. He writes this intriguing line. Something must have happened to me some time ago. That statement is true of every human being who has ever lived. People are basically good. Good. Now if you watch the nightly news, you might think otherwise. There is this murder here and that rape over there. This hit and run here and a robbery over there. This kidnapping here and this act of arson over here. And we see that splashed on the television night after night after night. But these are the acts that get the headlines. But they're not the norm. They just aren't. The news media reports them because they're out of the ordinary. Now you see these criminal acts night after night and you begin to think that maybe they become the ordinary but actually they are exceptions to the rule. People are basically good most of the time. What you see on television night after night is a minuscule part of the entire population. That shouldn't surprise us. If we go back and read the first two chapters of Genesis, where it tells us the creation story, at regular and repeated intervals, the Creator looked upon what He had made and He saw that it was good. And He pronounced it that way. And after creating man and woman, He stood back and He said something a little different, didn't He? He said, this is good. Very good. Then something happened. Genesis 3 tells us what happened. And of all things that happened, at the very center of unequaled beauty in a garden called Eden. The place of perfection. And at the entry point of what happened, this bad thing that happened, the entry point was a human being, someone who was good. And then to make matters even worse, this bad thing that happened was a matter of choice. Nothing was forced upon this original couple. They just freely chose to disregard that one rule, just one. As a teenager, wouldn't you have loved to have had one rule? One? 
We could have done it. <laughs> but they disobeyed this one rule. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of knowledge nor its fruit. And here's the real kicker. The choice is made out of God's wonderful gift that has been given to this man and woman. The choice was made by reason up here. It was their reason that made them choose to eat the fruit. This couple in the garden did not act out of instinct. They did not act out of intuition, but out of reason. When the prospect of the forbidden fruit was presented to her, Eve the woman saw, and I'm quoting scripture, that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to her eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make her wise. See, she thought that out. She wasn't doing it intentionally to put God down. She reasoned. Well, this is a good thing. I'll do it. By their choice, we have been left with a humanity where something must have happened. And still worse, it's still happening. Adam, who once had seen just earlier in the chapel, in the chapter, Adam, who had seen his wife, Eve, referred to her as bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And after he eats the fruit, he says to God, if it hadn't been for you giving that woman to me, how do you go from bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh to you gave her to me? What a distance that is. Perhaps this is illustrated in the words of Eugene Peterson, who has written that biblical translation called The Message. He writes, There is spiritual war in progress, an all-out moral battle. There is evil and cruelty and unhappiness and illness. There is superstition and ignorance, brutality and pain. God is in continuous and energetic battle against all of it. He goes on. God is for life and against death. God is for love and against hate. God is for hope and against despair. God is for heaven and against hell. There is no neutral ground in the entire universe. Every square foot is contested. We began by saying that people are generally good most of the time. But as surely as there is goodness in our world, there is something that opposes goodness. If I use the word evil with you, I'll end up losing some of your attentiveness. We all know that evil exists, but we often place it at the door of extremism. Adolf Eichmann while awaiting trial for his key role in the horrendous acts of the Holocaust, said, to sum it all up, I have no regrets. That's evil. Evil is like pornography. You'll know it when you see it. That's evil. But that's the extreme case, isn't it? And that's what we usually think of evil, that it's acts done in the extreme. But the biblical point of view has a much wider understanding of the word evil. Something changed that day in the garden. God's good guidance got exchanged for a snake's trickery. Something happened to goodness that day. Something happened that impacts our life even through the garden so the garden story is anciently old. The origin of sin, the origin of temptation, the origin of evil began that day. The Garden of Eden trickery comes down to this, I think. We humans are capable of not only resisting God's goodness, far worse 
We are capable of persuading ourselves that God is with us in our resistance. It's rare to find someone who perhaps knew the will of God better than a former president of ours, Abraham Lincoln. When he pointed out one day, both sides in the Civil War read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes God's aid against the other side. And we know that's true for both the North and the South. We often think that when temptation comes, it usually appeals to our passions, our instincts, <laughs> our pleasures. And oftentimes it does. I'm not doubting that. But temptation can also appeal to our logic and our sense of reasoning like it did to Eve. And she said, this fruit is good. And she said, this is good for me. She reasoned that. Both sides of the Civil War believed that God was on their side, so the North killed the South, and the South killed the North, and God's goodness was covered up with gun smoke, and the snake laughed. While hanging on the cross, Jesus first said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. One of the greatest tricks of the devil since the garden story is persuading the rest of us that we've done nothing for which we need to be forgiven. And why do we buy into that trickery? Why do we do that? Why are we so gullible? Here's why. Because we're good most of the time. That's why we buy into it. We are civilized, honest, caring, respectful people. And that's the truth. But we forget that we are civilized, honest, caring, and respectful people who covet our neighbor's wife, become jealous of someone else's good fortune, gossip behind each other's back, speak with profanity, are quick to blame, who expect others to think like ourselves, who hold grudges, who behave at times, this has got me like a spoiled brat, who would rather doubt God at times than place faith in God, who aren't willing to give up bad habits who excuse ourselves because we're too old to change now. You heard that one? Who deny the truth about ourselves, who look away when someone's in need, who excuse ourselves because, well, I've served my time. I've done the work. Who've given in to greed, who want more control, who stubbornly resist healthy choices. We are people who deny our own dark sides. That's us. No, we're not Adolf Eichmann. But this is us. And I just came out of the gate with those. There's a lot more. <laughs> are we getting the point? No, we're not Eichmann. But we are among those very people Jesus had in mind with his prayer, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Yes, something has happened to each and every one of us. We resist God's goodness. We overlook his blessings. We rationalize our mistakes. And when we do, the snake is laughing. Our eyes are wide open to big sins murder, theft, child abuse, rape, but our eyes are not so opened to lesser sins like the list I just read for you, which in large part represent our daily sins. 
This world is not always willing to support the will of God. That's at the thesis of this entire new theme of sermons. Evil gets in the way. Sin gets in the way. Temptations gets in the way. We good people can get in the way. We can even misuse religion. We can misuse it to get in the way of what God wants for us. Blaise Pascal, who was a man of scientific genius, but he was also a devoted Christian, once said, listen carefully to this, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. Wow. Watch out for that one. I believe that the distinguishing mark of a discipled Christian is how often they pray, Thy will be done. Not mine, God, but your will be done. Yes, those are the very words Jesus had taught his disciples when he taught them how to pray. This week in your prayers, I encourage you to close each one of your prayers with, Thy will be done, Lord. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That's an amazing statement coming from a man who is hanging on a cross. But he meant it. I mean, he really meant it. Is there evil in this unwilling world? Yes. Is there temptation in this unwilling world? Yes. Is there sin in this unwilling world? Yes. But there is also Jesus Christ in this unwilling world. And he is willing to forgive us at our worst so that we can be forgiven to be our best. That's just the truth. Amen.